I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to the Great War. Cribs, yo. Uh, anyhow, come on in, this is where I live. Uh, this is my kitchen, where you just walked into. It's not clean, it's not dirty. These are some old pulp covers from the 1940s that I thought were good. Girls Out of Hell, How Cheap Can You Get, Reform School Girl, and of course, Marijuana, in which a cheap and evil girl sets a hopped up killer against a, a whole city. Ooh. Uh, that's the King and Queen of Sweden, uh, roughly 40 years ago on their wedding day. I'm not the biggest fan one way or the other of the king and queen, but I bought this because I really like the frame and I was gonna put uh, something else in it. You know, I got it secondhand, but I just never got around to. And speaking of that, if you come into the living room, you'll see that I have a bunch of other frames that I bought that came with pictures that I was going to remove and I never got around to doing it. So I have to make up stories about these people and say that they're various relatives of mine. For example, uh, Chester A. Chet the Jet Stevens, uh, left fielder for the Chicago White Sox. From 1912 until 1920, he was uh, implicated in the Black Sox scandal, you know, throwing the 1919 World Series on purpose to gamblers and barred from baseball for life in 1920. Uh, I play a lot of music, as you may notice, because there's musical instruments all over the house. Uh, moving right along, you're probably wondering where I sleep. We'll get there in a moment. We come to the Hall of Dreams, which I just named. Um, his is the Brady Bunch. I'm a big Brady Bunch fan. Now, Mike Brady, the father, is not in the picture. I'm assuming that he was the cameraman, or maybe he was at work and they figured they'd have a family portrait while he was at work. This is a gold record. As I said, I play with a lot of bands. I play with seven bands at the moment, and sometimes the bands that I play with are extremely successful. Um, like this picture, for example. This is from 2003, from the Money Brother Fall 2003 tour. The, that's when we got the gold record, actually. Um, this is my very first uh, baseball team from 1974, as it says. That's me, the kid with glasses. Uh, this is the worst family portrait of my whole family that I could find, which is why I put it up, because we, we all look a lot better in real life, even in 1987, when that was taken. And this is uh, my bedroom. These are two of four cats. They're outdoor cats, so... You know, you usually only have one or two home at any given time. Um, and there's a shower, and I have a, a sauna. The sauna is actually full of stuff at the moment, but it takes 20 minutes to heat up, and it takes like 15 minutes for me to just throw everything on the bed when I want to have a sauna. Now, the reason that I have a sauna is this, this apartment, it, it wasn't an apartment. It was not built as an apartment. In the 80s and in the 90s, it was a brothel. It was a bordello. And the women that worked here, or lived here, or ran it. Uh, it was called Sophia, because that's the neighborhood, Sophia's Sauna Club. And so they put in a sauna, so they had some sort of legitimate thing. Now they were thrown out in 1996, and I moved here in 1998, and of course I still have the sauna. And twice since I moved here, someone has knocked on the door and wanted to know if they could still get a massage here. And I never needed the money badly enough to do that. So this is where I live. Um, I guess you've got a reasonably good idea of it. It's not particularly large, it's not particularly small, uh, but this is not where I work. This is not where I write the Great War. I rent an office space nearby, and that's where I'm going to take you right now. This is my neighborhood in Stockholm, Sweden. Now, Stockholm is mostly made up of islands, and this is the south island of the inner city, but you notice it looks kind of like a suburb, but it's not. We're in the middle of the inner city, even though it's got a small town feel. We are just about to my office. It is in the back of this building. Even if I'm just gonna do like half an hour or 40 minutes work, I'll still come all the way here and do it and then go home instead of doing it at home because I never get anything done if I work at home. Okay, this is my office space. This is where I write The Great War. Now this place is about a 20 minute walk from my house. It's uh, on the same island, the same part of Stockholm. And the people, uh, there's eight or nine other people that have spaces here and they're all artists or designers or they work with furniture or they do graphic stuff and I write. So that's what I do here. Um, my desk, full of books about the First World War. What I'll do when I write things, um, I'll open up 
like four or five Word documents, and they'll, each one will be for a week of the, of the war, a single episode. And I'll write like five episodes at once. I use this, the Chronology of the Great War. It's an old like library book from, what, 70, 80 years ago. And I'll go through that, and it just lists each theater of war, the specific events that happened, like a U-boat sank this and 53 people died. It'll just list that. So I'll list all of these in like five documents, right? And then I'll spend a few days reading all of these books, online newspapers, online resources, and figuring out exactly why these specific events happened, uh, things around them, what was going on in the specific countries, who joined the war, who died, who became a hero, which general was being foolish. And I'll spend a few days just putting that together in my head and making notes on each of these episodes. And then, for each of the four or five weeks, I'll write a hook and a conclusion. Now the hook, you'll notice that every episode starts with something that we haven't seen in the war at this point. It could be the first use of poison gas. It could be um, interrupter gear so you could fire your uh, machine gun through your propellers. It could be Italy joins the war. It could be something like that. But every single week, something new happened some tactics, some new innovation that we haven't seen yet. So I write the hook that's based on what happened that week, and then I'll write the conclusion that links back to the hook, and then I'll write the content. And it takes, it takes a while to write the content because I have to organize all the notes by the different theaters of war, and I have to sort of connect them. You know, one week I might not mention the Western Front because so much was happening in the Eastern Front or Gallipoli, but of course if things were happening in the Western Front that week, I'll just have to catch up with it you know, the next week. Um, since I try to keep these episodes about 1,500 words, so it's about nine minutes on camera. And that's what I do. And I'll sit down and do some work right now. All right, we hope that you enjoyed our behind the scenes and a glimpse into the mind of the team behind the Great War. If you want to see us on the road more often, consider helping us on Patreon. And if you want to see me answering questions for Out of the Trenches, click here. Don't forget to subscribe.